Gaza War Day 347. You guys knew I'd be here the other day, and I'm sure tonight you knew I'd be back. We have to talk about the pager attack. But uh, let's get some other stuff out of the way first. Um, in terms of our usual no end in sight report, I mean, do I need to say more? But we will talk about the, we do need to talk about the fact that Israel is now recruiting Navy personnel for army duties, uh, as well as offering some kind of temporary asylum arrangement for African refugees, asylum seekers, 30,000 of them in Israel, who are uh, being offered a chance to get some status in Israel. Of course, Israel is a thoroughly racist country in terms of racism against Africans. There was unbelievable racism against Africans when years ago, the um, there were a lot of asylum seekers that were going to Israel and uh, some of the stuff that was said and publicly done at that time was, um, well, people who know what Israel is now, a lot of people know what it is now, uh, would probably understand what was going on then. But at the time, it was pretty shocking because there were a lot of illusions about Israel being something other than what it is. Um. Okay, so Israel's personnel problems, recruiting issues are uh, definitely not gone away. And they're searching for other sources of, um, of people, of uh, troops. And so, okay, so now you remember the other two days ago I was talking about we talked about the missile. It was called the Palestine 2, it turned out. Yemen produced a video about it, of the launch of it and everything. It was the, I guessed that it was the Palestine missile because they tested that missile and they said that it was a hypersonic ballistic missile. And uh, and so they, they showed the launch of that. And its range, and it hit, I guess, Tel Aviv at the end of its range, 2,000 and some kilometers. And... Uh, and travels, they said, at Mach 18, so way, uh, so many times faster than the speed of sound. Very, it's very hypersonic um, for those that follow the technology a bit. Uh, solid fuel missile, uh, which is not common in the world. Uh, I'm told that very few countries have solid fuel technology. And uh, Yemen is among them, apparently. So uh, Nasr al-Din Amr, the vice president of the Ansar al Media Authority, told the Shahab agency yesterday, I think, we are ready to send hundreds of thousands of trained fighters to Hezbollah if needed, and we will support them in the same way that we support our brothers in the resistance in Palestine. We aim to expand our capability to strike any target across the entire territory of occupied Palestine, and we are working on this at a fast pace. Yesterday's missile is not part of the response to the bombing of Hodeida port, and likewise, the Yaffa drone will not be used for isolated strikes in response only. Rather, it will be part of ongoing operations until the aggression on Gaza stops. Once again, you see the resistance axis tying publicly the end of their operations against Israel to the end of aggression on Gaza. There's no other way for Israel to get out of being attacked from Hezbollah, from Ansar Allah, besides from Kataib Hezbollah in Iraq. There's no other way besides making, um, ending the aggression and withdrawing from Gaza and ending the siege of Gaza, which is one of Yemen's specific conditions. I mentioned that Yahya Sinwar had written a message to Malik Houthi, and it was a strong message, I would say. So we have now, ever since uh, Ismail Haniye died and Yahya Sinwar became the overall leader of Hamas. We we have more of these direct messages. I mean, Ismail Haniyeh made these kinds of communications, so it makes sense that Sinwar is. It's just it's just strange to have Sinwar from underground sending these open public messages. But that's 
the reality of the situation. They have Abu Obeda as the Qassam spokesman, and then they have messages coming directly from Yahya Sinwar to different leaders of the resistance, including uh, Syed Abdel Malik Badr al-Din al-Houthi, who I've been calling Malik Houthi. Um, our people, Sinwar says, writes, uh, our people in the Gaza Strip are living between the hardship of aggression and siege and the valiant resistance led by Al-Qassam brigades. Al-Qassam brigades carried out the October 7th attack with unmatched skill and have been waging a defensive battle for an entire year, exhausting the enemy and inflicting heavy damage. I assure you, so Yahya Sinwar, assuring Malik Houthi, that the resistance is strong and what the enemy is claiming is nothing but lies and psychological warfare. We have prepared ourselves for a long war of attrition that will break the enemy's political will, just as the Al-Aqsa flood broke their military will. This, uh, I think, is one of the strongest clues to the overall strategy that the resistance is pursuing here. We are prepared. We have prepared ourselves for a long war of attrition that will break the enemy's political will, just as the Al Aqsa flood broke their military will. So, just chew on that as I finish this letter. Our combined efforts with you and with our valiant brothers in the resistance in Lebanon and the Islamic resistance in Iraq will break this enemy and bring about its defeat. So, Yahya Sinwar. I think I went over his novel a few sit reps ago. It's pretty clear that Yahya Sinwar understands the war with Israel as a battle of wills. And he understands as the commander of this battle that victory means breaking their political will. He's, their military will is broken already. So they're not um, the dominant military force that they were before. That's their, their self-image is shattered. Their image before the world is shattered. But they have this political will to go on and on. They have the will to sacrifice the prisoners. They have the will to commit unbelievable acts of depravity including the one today. And uh, they have the will to defy international opinion, to defy public, uh, you know, the, the public, to defy the, the parts of the Israeli public that are telling them to stop. And, of course, to defy the entire global south, to defy the bloc in the West that is anti-genocide. They have the will to, they have the political will to defy all of those. And that is going to be broken by a long war of attrition, according to Yahya Sinwar in this letter to Malik Houthi. So let's finish with the war of attrition and the sit rep today before we get into the pager attack. So uh, in the West Bank, there's fighting in Nablus, explosive devices in Balata, fighting with the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank who are out there disarming uh, explosive devices that are planted to fight the Israelis. Um, there's fighting in Tulkaram. So there's continuous fighting in the West Bank, continuous reports of fighting in the West Bank. In Gaza, there was a big massacre in Burej, so one of the Israeli daily massacres. And there's fighting in Rafa. There was what the Israelis call a difficult incident in the Philadelphia corridor in which at least four Israeli soldiers were killed. So, and the helicopters came and picked up the, evac the Israeli evacuees. So that's the fighting in West Bank and Gaza in occupied Palestine. That's the letter from Yahya Sinwar to Malik Houthi. And that's some of the debriefing that Yemen made over the missile attack with their hypersonic ballistic Palestine 2 missile uh, a couple days ago. Now we get to Lebanon and this pager attack. So for those who don't know, and I'm not sure how you don't know, but 
if especially I'm pretty sure everybody who's here tonight knows, but if you don't know, um, 3,000 plus pagers in Lebanon and in Syria, some in Syria, a couple dozen in Syria, exploded all at the same time. Israel is gloating on it. They didn't officially take responsibility, but they're gloating about it in all their social media. Making just hilarious jokes about uh, all the brutal injuries that have resulted from these pagers exploding. So 2,800 plus wounded, 200 in critical condition, at least nine killed, one 10-year-old girl. So really devastating attack in terms of like as an act of terrorism. It's a very successful act of terrorism. If this was done by a cartoon villain, if this if there was a if there was a thriller plot written about a villain who was planning to blow up thousands of pagers at the same time with a radio frequency signal and the heroes were trying to foil this attack, that would make a good plot for good guys to try to prevent a villain from blowing up all these pagers. So um who we know more or less who did it. They didn't admit it, although they did admit it. They kind of joked about it. There's nobody else that it would possibly make sense who would do it or who could. Okay, how did they do it? There's different ideas floating around. I think, I'll tell you what I think, but I'll tell you the different theories. So one theory is that there was some kind of exploit in terms of the software where they could talk to the pager and convince the pager, the lithium battery in the pager to overheat and explode. So Edward Snowden tweeted about this today and Snowden doesn't think that that's how it works because, and I think this is probably right. That's what I, this is just what I think. But he said that if that was the case, you would have seen a lot of small fires and a lot of misfires. And I don't know if anybody's ever been around. These things do happen by accident. Sometimes batteries do go on fire and sometimes they do explode. Um, and, you know, they cause fires, they cause all kinds of damage, but it doesn't, to me, that doesn't seem, that doesn't seem quite right. So the other theory that's going around and Hezbollah is doing their own investigation. So we will eventually find out. But the other theory is that they, the Israelis either intercepted a shipment of these pagers or made it some have some kind of deal through Western intelligence with Western American intelligence with the company Motorola that supplies these pagers. And they modified the pagers sometime before delivery the hard, at the hardware level and introduced some explosive material, grams, a few grams of explosives into each pager that could then be triggered remotely. And that makes a lot more sense to me in terms of what Snowden said, um, in terms of uh, the way hacking actually works. You know, there are soft there are software exploits for sure, but you know, intelligence agencies, the type of hacking that they do, they like to do physical access. They like to do physical interception. They like to insert things into the devices. You may or may not know that a major resistance figure was assassinated uh, by Israel with an exploding cell phone. It was um, it was in the nineties, I think, maybe the early two thousands. Um, Inside history, <laughs> yeah, it's, there's an article today. Inside Israel's history of inventive assassination methods. Uh, Mossad. Oh, come on, you're paywalling me, really? Uh, exploding Palestinian leader. Let's see. I think it was. I don't want to say the name. I know. I I think I know the name, but I don't want to say the wrong name. Yeah, that's who I thought it was. Yahya Ayash. So. Yahya Ayash, otherwise known as the engineer, 
Um, and it was he was killed in 1996. Uh, I think John Elmer's mentioned Yahya Ayash on the resistance report many times. Um, and yeah, so he was assassinated by a booby-trapped cell phone. I mean, back then, the cell phones uh, in 1996, cell phones were pretty big. And, uh, and okay, so, you know, that's, that's why I think it was a physical thing. And, and that, it makes more sense to me because lots of pagers didn't blow up. The ones that blew up may have been from a batch that came sometime in the past months. So it was like a sleeper batch, right? So Israel had the ability to do this for months. They got this batch, they intercepted it all these all these pagers they could have blown up and then they blew it up and there's an interesting question about why they blew it up now uh let me get to that in a second let's let's just talk about who uses pagers because i was skeptical even of um the fact that maybe this wasn't even hezbollah maybe this was just people with pagers because hospital staff use pagers right and I suspect it's like a dual use kind of thing. Pagers, you can get a page on a, you know, a radio network, I, I think. And then you get a page and then you call the person back or you just send coded messages on using the pager, right? Um, so you don't need to be on a cell phone network. You don't need to be on the internet, which Hassan Nasrallah explicitly warned people about um, in one of his speeches. He warned people against using um, using the internet and using those ring lights and use uh, you know the those different recording devices and internet linked things. So so pagers, you know, you could imagine pagers would be part of a communication system because Hezbollah has a wired telephone network, which they almost went to war over. It's, uh, I remember a decade, more than a decade ago, Nasrallah made a speech because the Lebanese government at the behest of Israel at the time was going threatening to tear up the wired telephone network. And Nasrallah said, basically, if you're trying to attack our weapons that we need to defend the country against Israel, then you are a traitor and you'll be treated the same way as Israel. So Needless to say, the authorities backed off of that after that speech. So pagers would be a part, potentially, of the um, way Hezbollah operates. Um, if you're trying to avoid using cell phones, if you're trying to avoid using um, the internet for security purposes, this, this is an alternative. It's a simple system. <laughs> And it's it's very on brand in terms of what Hezbollah does, right? They have low tech solutions, resilient low tech kinds of solutions, and pagers are possibly a part of that. But who else uses pagers? Remember, Hezbollah is not solely an underground network. It's not an underground organization. It's a political party. A lot. It's an openly functioning political party with lots all the things that really well-organized parties have in terms of clubs and societies and health care and education and all of these all of these kinds of things his his bola has all of these kinds of activities that they do so they have above ground it's a it's a legal political party and a lot of the people that were injured were from that a lot of some of the people who were killed were from totally above ground legal in Lebanon organizations. Um, and some were affiliated, had no affiliation whatsoever with Hezbollah because who else uses pagers? Medical people use pagers. Um, medical people use pagers. They still use pagers. You page your doctor. You can still page your doctor. They don't all use cell phones because uh, I think there's reasons why you can't have a cell phone in a hospital. Maybe I'll ask Tarek for more detail on why they still use pagers but it might be because of the magnetic resonance imagers or i don't know there might there, there are probably some very good reasons why um but they do medical people use pagers and so a lot of medical people were blown up today because they use pagers and um a lot of people were blown up 
because they were near pagers. So it's um it was just um it was just a terrorism attack. It was just a terrorist attack. And you know, I think history will show that like a lot of things that Israel has been doing, it wasn't really worth it. What do I mean? Okay. I will address, I will get back to the question of why now, but in terms of the question of what were the benefits, what are the benefits, what are the military benefits versus the military costs here? Let's analyze it in those terms. The military benefits are you potentially kill leaders, you cause, um, you, you create a moment of distrust in existing communication networks, which can create a larger panic or um, larger uh, chaos, I guess, as people try to switch to less um, secure systems, people try to switch to backup systems, people um, may now worry about their other devices. So there's going to be a whole period of adjustment and while that ha while that those adjustments are happening presumably they'll be more vulnerable their command and control will be more vulnerable maybe there'll be more chances to infiltrate and exploit for israel okay military benefit the actual murderousness of the attack is military benefit if indeed this was a major tool that hezbollah used then you may have killed a bunch of hezbollah people and wounded a whole bunch more Along with the civilians, Israel doesn't care. Um, and as long as it's Israel doing it, nobody in the West cares whether tons of civilians or children are killed in the course of Israel killing who it wants. If they kill people that had nothing to do with, on, uh, with it on the way to killing people they wanted to kill, nobody in the West cares. So none of those are costs. Those are all just benefits to them. Killing 20, wounding 3,000 people, critically injuring 200 people, killing at least 10 people. That's Those are all benefits for Israel. That's what the kind of thing Israel celebrates. That's the kind of people Israelis are now. Um, and, uh, and so all of those can be in the benefit column. What about the costs? So in terms of the costs, when you use a trick like this, and this was a trick, um, you uh, can't do it again, right? Um, there's going to be a lot more scrutiny of the supply chain of any devices, of any communications. There's going to be an investigation. Hezbollah is going to get to the bottom of how this happened. And uh, this trick was, um, you know, it was used to good effect. But now I think it's going to cast a huge shadow of doubt over all Western tech. Um, as people have tweeted, um, I think Syed Mohammed Morandi from Iran, he said, don't buy any phones or devices that were made in Taiwan or Japan or America that are part of that. That There's an entire Korea, there's an entire chain, there's an entire supply chain of devices, which is like the, you know, the cutting edge of all technology in which China is competing with this whole East Asian slash American alternative to China. And there, this is a chip war that you've probably heard about. There's a tech war that you've heard about. And America's organized, you know, Taiwan and Japan and Korea. I mean, Taiwan and Korea, ultimately. Japan is already out of the game for the most part. But um, there's a stack you know, there's a system that the Americans are are using to um, build out phones and other and computers and tablets and everything, and uh, and then there's 
Chinese alternatives, you know, namely Huawei and and others. And um, and if you're in the global south, you got to go with the Chinese alternative now, right? So the other one could literally kill you. It's one thing to to discover, as many European leaders discovered, thanks to the aforementioned Edward Snowden. It's one thing to discover that the Americans are using these devices to spy on you. It's one thing to discover that the Israelis have in installed direct in undetectable software onto your device to spy on you and track you and stuff like that. Okay. I mean, the police are going to use your devices to spy on you and track you and arrest you for whatever they want to at some point in the West, right? That's what the West does. And, and surveillance of you through your phone is like one of the, one of the things that everybody just accepts in the West. It's another thing you know, you're the German leader, you're the Brazilian president, you're the German chancellor, you know that your American device is spying on you and transmitting information to the Americans, fine, or the Israelis, fine. You're a global, you're a South African leader, whatever, fine. But if you, if this thing can blow up and kill you, that's another, that's a, that's a, that's a lot more to ask, right? It's a lot more, America can say, look, just run this, use this device. We're going to spy on you. It's a great device. You know, you can watch videos on it. You can tweet and, and do Instagram and take photos and watch TikToks and stuff. It's, it's a great device. Um, you can chat on it. You can receive electoral scientific misinformation on it right to your phone. <laughs> You can receive pro-Israel propaganda right to your phone. You can watch genocide on your phone. So it's a great thing. You can't really do without it. Just accept that we're going to spy on you. Okay. Just accept that we're going to blow it up and kill you at some point, or that we can, and that's like one of the things that you have to accept might happen to you. That's another, that's a lot more to ask. That's a, that's a, that's a profound thing to ask. It's a heavy thing to ask. And um, I think a lot of people will, I think this could tip the balance for a lot of people in terms of which technological choices to make, whether to go with the Chinese option or the Western option, a lot of which is still made in China, but ultimately controlled by a supply chain controlled by the West, by the Americans. So that's a big cost, and that's the kind of cost that we won't see for a long time. That's the kind of cost that's going to emerge over a long period of time. It's going to unfold over the coming years, but it's going to emerge. It can't not. And, that, and those are ripples from this single day. This single day. In this single day, this single day, Israel did more to undermine trust in American technology than probably any other single day in history because they actually killed people. Like, this is way bigger a deal than the Snowden revelations. So, um, so why did they do it today? There's a couple of things. There was, um, Israel said they foiled an assassination plot against one of their officials. Now, they may have said this in preparation for doing this today. But maybe it was real. Maybe they really found a bomb or something that was going to blow up one of their officials. Doesn't seem like that all that likely to me, but supposing that's true, maybe that was their that was their decision okay well then let's blow up all the pagers maybe um maybe they got a sense that they this whole plot was going to be discovered so if if the plot's going to be discovered you have to blow it up i don't i also don't see any signs that it was on the verge of being discovered but um you know we won't know until hezbollah makes their statement 
and if any of those were true. Another one that I've heard is that Hezbollah made a very successful attack against Israeli intelligence a few days back. That was their retaliation for the assassination of Fouad Shokor. Israeli intelligence is the one who presumably intercepted these pages and installed explosives in these pages and set up this whole plot. So maybe they figured they would trigger it as a revenge, as a revenge for the revenge of Hezbollah for Fouad Shokor. Maybe. Um, maybe it's another sub-threshold alternative to trying to invade Lebanon. Um, that's what Amal Saad thinks. Amal Saad being one of the most perceptive and knowledgeable uh, watchers of this war. Amal Saad is a prof based in the UK. She's, I think, Lebanese background, and she wrote, I think, the book on Hezbollah, a really good book on Hezbollah called Hezbollah Politics and Religion that I yet read decades ago. Okay, so Amal Saad's thread, Israel's unprecedented and highly sophisticated security operation today in which almost 3,000 people have been injured so far. This was 1 p.m. my time, so about 11 hours ago is by all means a massive blow to Hezbollah. This is all the more so the case given that Hezbollah has always credited its performance in the July war to its primitive telecom network, which relied on pagers and a fiber optic internal line. By neutralizing Israel's technolo technological superiority with simplicity, to borrow Nasrallah's terms, Hezbollah prevented Israel from disrupting its command and control system. Today's attack effectively negates this advantage. I think Amal Saad... Uh, who knows more than me, I admit, maybe overstating it here. I don't think it effectively negates the advantage. I think it, um, let's say, I would rather say it, um, it causes damage in spite of the advantage. Uh, okay, so Amal Saad now is addressing why now. The question is, why did Israel choose to prematurely play this card outside the context of all-out war, where a disruption of this magnitude could have changed the course of the war? Again, I'm not sure it could have changed the course of the war. Um, I don't know that, I don't know, I just don't, I don't see even a disruption of this magnitude being able to change the course of the war. Uh, it would do damage, like if you bomb, if you kill a commander, it makes a difference if you kill a bunch of commanders, if you take out a whole unit somewhere, all of these things can happen in war. It wouldn't necessarily change the course of the war. Israel surely knows that Hezbollah will now review and amend its entire communication protocols, which suggests that Israel has other aims that could well sh fall short of war. So I agree with that. I agree with Amal Saad on that, that Israel knows that Hezbollah will now amend its communication protocols. The question is, does Hezbollah have to default to inferior options or what, right? They're going to have a period where they don't, however, even if it might even be over now, but there would be after an attack like this, a period where you don't know exactly what is trusted and what's not and what else is coming. And that's a very vulnerable place to be. Amal continues, uh, the operation appears to have been designed as a major spectacle, potentially serving dual purposes to demoralize Hezbollah's cadres and instill uncertainty while acting as a course of deterrent aimed at altering their force positioning on the border. It's not going to be a deterrent, so I don't think it's going to serve that purpose. Demoralization? Sure. Specific demoralization in your own technology, in your co communication system, uh, would. there's no way that's not going to happen. Uh, Israel appears, fourth and final tweet in the series, um, to have developed a unique military security paradigm in its war on Lebanon. Its daily assassination campaign via drone warfare blurs the line between prolonged security measures and traditional warfare. Today's attack consolidates this novel paradigm, which acts more as a substitute for all-out conventional war, at least for the time being. Again, I don't know. I don't know if they can substitute. They're talking a lot about... Um, this big war, we're seeing more and more signs of it. Uh, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they can navigate our way their way out of it. I think they're going 
you know, I thought it was going to happen in the summer, so I'm not going to make any more predictions uh, about it. I think you only get one. You're only allowed one prediction about a specific event. And so I've lost mine. I've played my card. But the various signs of an attack, uh, you know, the way they're talking, this event, um, deeper kinds of hits into Lebanon that have been happening, all of these suggest uh, that the war on Lebanon, the war between Israel and Lebanon, the ground war is going to happen. And it's going to happen soon. Uh, so Hussein, eyes on South 1 on X, he said, you kill and you get killed, uh, but victory is for those willing to endure. So um, I think that's another point. You know, I've, I've made a video before called Israel's Day. I think when they assassinated Ismail Haniyeh and Fawad Shoker, uh, that was one of their days, you know, they assassinated people important people and uh that's what they consider victory that's victory to them and a big terrorist attack like this is victory for them i think another lebanese journalist hassan iliak he said war is back and forth this is a deceitful strike and our resistance will handle it as it has accustomed us with great resilience calm nerves boarding the enemy's goals and finding ways to deter and make it pay for what it's committed but the point is war is back and forth there's not a war um where the especially the resistance which is outgunned out uh you know outgunned at every turn uh just marches from one victory to another israel is going to have good days by its own measure and today was one of them but uh, as someone, Chairman Miao, uh, that's, a, that's a pun I've been making for years myself, uh, Chairman Miao wrote in a reply to me, um, this is like putting cyanide in the water supply because a few people who drink it might be soldiers, a military strategy akin to a gas chamber. They spent all those resources and exposed an entire supply chain of companies who put bombs in their product for nothing of value and i think that's uh actually the, the closer that's a closer reading to mine it's a much closer reading to mine and that's uh that's what i think i think the implications of this are going to be pretty bad for the west and um and yeah i mean in terms of their short-term terrorist uh celebration I think it's a day of celebration for them. Um, and I, I don't know. I hope it was worth it. Um, I guess I'll stop there. That's the sit rep for tonight. And um, I'm sure we'll, more will be happening on the Lebanon front in the coming days. So I'll see you in the next one probably very soon. Uh, hang in there. And uh, please like and subscribe and all the rest. Take care, everybody.